world needs more people with curious minds. People who aren't afraid to admit when they don't know something. We need to take the time to encourage more lifelong learners. At least, that's my goal with this podcast. I think the future is at stake. But at the same time, I do believe that a more informed population can and will move humanity forward. All we have to do is keep learning. All right, what's going on, everybody? Welcome back to Nick Learns Everything. So I recently learned about this Instagram account called at Texas Bee Works. And the Instagram account is run by a lady who's a bee activist. And it's a super cool account, but I honestly have never seen anything like it in my life. She is in most of the videos just taking handfuls of bees with her bare hands and removing them from people's houses. So like in a garbage can or on a deck or a garage or something like that. And she will talk about, she'll do like a voiceover with all these videos and she'll talk about, in this instance, I could tell the bees weren't very anxious. I knew they weren't going to sting me. And she will just scoop them up in two hands, put them into this uh, container that I guess acts as like a uh, makeshift beehive for them so she can transport them. And then what's crazy is she'll go and she'll also take out these, what she calls honeycomb structures, which is like the beehive. But they're huge. It's not like a beehive when you're a kid, like a little one, like when you're a kid, like a little golf ball size one by your garage or something like that. These are like massive, like the size of my laptop, like honeycomb structures. There's bees all over them. And she'll just take them out with her bare hands, set them in a separate container. So when she relocates them, the bees have some sort of structure they're familiar with. And so that got me thinking about bees. And I know it's it's a random thing, but it's one of those things that you learn about when you're a kid, and then you kind of just push it to the side. You don't really look up more bee facts. I'm sure there are people who do, and they go on to have professions uh, where they work with bees, but I think for the average person, you kind of learn about bees when you're a kid, and then you forget about it. And I wanted to know why bees need an advocate, so I went ahead and looked it up. And I found an article from ABC News in 2019 that I think summed it up well. And the article reads, quote, Worldwide, honeybees and other pollinators help to produce about $170 billion in crops. Scott McArt, assistant professor of pollinator health at Cornell University, told ABC News. And First of all, reading that, I'm thinking to myself, it's amazing that Cornell has enough money to hire somebody with as specific of a job as assistant professor of pollinator health. That is, I would have never guessed in a million years that that could be someone's job title. So that is phenomenal by itself. But the fact that bees are responsible for uh, about $170 billion, with a B, dollars in crops, is also incredible. And so uh, the article goes on to say that over the past 15 years, bee colonies have been disappearing in what is known as the, quote, colony collapse disorder. And that's according to National Geographic. Some regions have seen the losses of up to 90%. That is crazy. The fact that there are areas of the world where 90% of the bees have been decimated is wild. When you're talking about $170 billion in crops can be attributed to the fact that we have bees. That right there is why bees need advocacy. That is why there are bee activists, because bees are wildly important to the economy. And take a second, to think about how many jobs are connected to that $170 billion in crops. Because it's not just the people with those jobs. It's their families that are also affected by the population of bees worldwide. And because of that, and because the bee population is declining, there clearly needs to be advocacy because people don't know this is going on. But the bees also need advocacy for another reason that I learned about. And that is because some people are actively using bees and bee venom 
for wellness purposes. And I know this because I mentioned the fact that I was going to maybe do an episode about bees to my fiance. And she showed me a show on Netflix called Unwell, which if you have not seen it, uh, it is a very, very interesting show that Netflix has created uh, where they touch on a variety of wellness topics, everything from, I think, essential oils, things like that, um, all the way up to some of the things I learned about in this B episode. And the reason that bees need advocacy in this particular example is because there are people who are using bee stings and bee venom in cosmetic pro uh, products. So what some of these people are doing is they're using bee venom as a replacement for Botox. They're using it in lotions. They're using it in face creams. And then they're also doing bee sting therapy, which, as I saw in the show, is where you pick up a bee with a pair of tweezers and press it against a part of your skin until it stings you and then you discard that bee and then you continue the process again and again and again now bee venom has been seriously used for medicinal reasons for thousands of years that is a fact the problem that i have with that fact though is that a lot of these snake oil salesman type people that are trying to get people to pay a ton of money to get stung by bees as a solution to chronic illnesses. They will often point to a fact like, hey, we've been bees have been used for thousands of years for medicine. And the reality is that is true, but the bulk of when they were being used for medicine was when we didn't have electricity and running water. I mean, the the when bees were used primarily as medicine, it was the type of time where if you had a bad attitude at work one day, they thought you were a witch. So it's like I, the bulk of the time we've been using bee therapy was in the past, you could argue, before we knew better. So I always have a tough time with people who will use that type of reasoning for something, especially when it's like a snake oil sales charlatan type thing like this. Is like the fact that we were using it a thousand years ago is probably because we should leave that idea a thousand years ago. We're going to use bee stings to cure things? That sounds like a thousand year old idea. And so when people started thinking that bee venom was a cure for MS, a Yale neurologist stepped in and started really looking into the field of bee therapy. And he was able to show that there's basically no proof at all that any of this stuff works. There's been research being done for decades about bee venom therapy, and it really, there's no conclusive evidence. I mean, at best, what people are using it for is essentially to undergo 12 hours of Botox. That's what you're getting. You're getting a lot of that stuff. And unfortunately, the bees need people to advocate for them because in a world where we need bees because the population is being decimated and it is a massive part of our food economy, you instead have people going around and using them to sting themselves so they can have their chronic illnesses be solved overnight. Yet the people running these types of organizations that are doing this are typically the type of people that when they are pressed about it, and I saw it with my own eyes on this Netflix show, they often say, well, we can't guarantee any results with this therapy. And typically, I'm going to give uh, everyone listening a piece of advice. If you are looking to have some sort of medical treatment take place that probably means that you want that medical treatment to work so if you have paid someone to provide you with some sort of medical treatment whether it's eastern or western medicine and they're telling you that they cannot guarantee at all whether or not it will work it is probably not a great use of your money 
I think the people listening to this podcast probably know that, but uh, apparently there are people in the world that don't. And that's honestly where I thought this episode was going to end. Bee advocacy is super important, and bee therapy, on the other hand, is some sort of Wild West scenario where you can just sort of say and do whatever you want. And I would love to meet some of the ringleaders of that movement because I always find it interesting to find people who are, I guess, as shady as I think those people are. I would love to see how someone like that's uh, brain ticks. I would love to be able to ask them a few basic questions about their therapy and uh, just kind of see what those responses are. But... Anyway, I did think that was where this episode was going to end, but it isn't because I think before we go, it would be a good idea to explore exactly how fascinating this creature, the bee is, that people are doing this stuff to. So my fiance asked me about the episode again, and apparently she's a bee expert now because she decided to say to me, hey, did you know bees can read? And of course, I did not know bees could read. So I started to think to myself immediately, like they can read, like as in like they could read books, like bees could sit down and read Fifty Shades of Grey, or they could literally read the Christian Bible, which doesn't make a lot of sense to me, because honestly, I mean, if bees could read the Christian Bible, they would obviously see it as this singular, unadulterated truth in the universe. And, I mean, bees, if they read it, would obviously feel compelled to give mega churches tax exemptions. And, I mean, the bees would also probably look around and just decide to largely ignore the pedophilia that runs rampant in certain parts of Christianity. So, I mean, if bees could read the Bible, I think they would obviously come to the same type of conclusions that we do because... I mean, once again, we are obviously the most advanced beings that have ever existed. So, I mean, if the bees could read the Bible, they would probably come to the same conclusions we have. But then again, maybe bees can read the Bible, but they just interpret it differently based on their experience. You know, I mean, I think maybe the bees understand religious teachings to be sort of a individually interpreted guidance rather than some sort of like rigid system of rules and guilt that you could use it as an excuse to hate people and commit all, then governments could use it to commit a bunch of atrocities. They might think about the Bible like that. But then I realized that she probably wasn't talking about bees being able to read books or paragraphs or anything like that. And so I decided to Google it. And I wanted to kind of end this episode by reading through some of my findings. So for this part, we're going to go ahead and turn to an article that I've pulled up here from Science Daily. And this article comes to us from, let me make sure I get this right, from RMIT University in Australia. And I want to look at this so we can get an idea and an understanding of how complex these creatures are that we are allowing crazy people to mutilate so they can sell snake oil to desperate people under the guise of Eastern medicine. Now, I'm going to be honest here. I read the first couple sentences and then decided that I wanted to organically walk down this road together. So I'm genuinely reading this for the first time. All right, so the summary says, we know bees get the concept of zero and can do basic math. <laughs> I, that's a pretty bold, uh, bold thing to assume that we all know. But now researchers have discovered that they may also be capable of connecting symbols to numbers. It's a finding that sheds new light on how numerical abilities may have evolved over millennia and even opens new possibilities for communication between humans and other species. This is what I'm talking about right here. This is what we need more of. Because right here, they're talking about, we could probably study bees and the way that they understand numbers and potentially lead us to be able to talk to our pets. And that is some research I am wholeheartedly behind. Because if I could talk to my dogs, oh, if, oh, if you know my dogs, that would be a conversation. But uh, yeah, let me go ahead and keep reading this here. So 
We've learned bees can understand just zero and do basic math. And now a new study shows their tiny insect brains may be capable of connecting symbols to numbers. Researchers have trained honeybees to match a character to a specific quantity, revealing that they are able to learn that a symbol represents a numerical amount. It's a finding that sheds new light on how numerical abilities may have evolved over millennia and even opens the possibilities for communication between humans and other species. The discovery from the same Australian French team that found bees get the concept of zero and can do arithmetic. Oh, okay. So they can do math. So a creature that we are allowing rich white women to kill in order to get 12 hours of Botox, that same creature is able to do math. And we just think that we should be like, oh, it's fine. These crazy people are just uh, using them for Botox. Terrible. Anyway, okay, so I'm going to keep reading it here. It says, it also points to new approaches for bio-inspired computing that can replicate the brain's highly efficient approach to processing. So, okay, yeah, perfect. So we're just going to use uh, B brains to, uh, I guess turn into computers bio-inspired computing i guess that's what that would mean okay so yeah b brains are so smart we can use them for computers but once again i have to find through instagram a b advocate wild it, this is see this is but this is why i like to do this podcast because we're learning you know we're learning together right now associate professor Adrian Dyer said while humans were the only species that have developed systems to represent numbers, like the Arabic numerals we use each day, the research shows the concept can be grasped by brains far smaller than ours. We take it for granted once we've learned our numbers as children, but being able to recognize what four represents actually requires a sophisticated level of cognitive ability, Dyer said. It's a hell of a point. I mean, that's the truth, right? It's like, you learn your numbers in sort of this memorization way, but then when you really think about it, it's like being able to know that four means four of something is rather sophisticated. Like a dog is not going to be able to figure that out, right? Most of the time. I'm sure some of those very smart, like those military and police dogs might be able to, but at least my dogs would not be able to. So that, I mean, that's a very good point. So he goes on to say, studies have shown primates and birds can also learn to link symbols with numbers, but this is the first time we've seen this in insects. Humans have over 86 billion neurons in our brains. Bees have less than a million, and we're separated by over 600 million years of evolution. That's crazy. All right, so if, but, okay, so, but if bees have the capacity to learn something as complex as human-made symbolic language, this opens up exciting new pathways for further communication across species. So basically, what they're saying is, if we understand that bees know math, and they can put a meaning to a symbol that we show them, like the number four, then we could teach them to learn other symbols, which would effectively make them able to read and communicate back with us. That's the type of intelligence in a creature that we need to be taken far more seriously, obviously. We have to. We absolutely have to. I mean, bees are a creature that we don't even understand all the way. They're vitally important to our food supply. And I think because of that, they do genuinely need advocacy. And I think it's super cool to see all these really compassionate, just I mean, just beautiful people that care so much and they want to work as activists for a species that most people overlook and actively try to kill. And I think it's cool to see people with that level of compassion, that they're willing to work like this lady is. And let's see, what, what was the name of her Instagram again? At Texas Bee Works. The fact that she is able to work in in trying to advocate for this creature that's so important to us, yet so overlooked, is really, really cool. And I think for all the type of people that do work like that, that's that's really awesome. And I hope everybody listening to this takes a second to maybe take a lesson from that one. You know, I think 
when you look at people that are spending their time day in and day out doing that type of work, it's easy to maybe overlook it. But I think when you realize why they're doing that work and when you see how compassionate people like that are and how much they they want their work to be able to be a an actual positive impact on society, that's that's really cool. And I think there's a big difference between someone like that whose work has a big impact on society in practice and someone who wants you to believe that their work has a big impact on society because they're helping all these people that are desperate with these illnesses by stinging them with bees and then the bees bleed out and die. And But I'm helping them because there's no proof that they're getting better, but I'm somehow helping... I think that we have to be able to look at things like that and understand how convoluted the one is and how genuinely thoughtful and inspiring the other one is. And I think we need to be able to make sure that people see the difference in that. So just my opinion. I think maybe uh, maybe something we can all take a lesson from. But guys, if you enjoyed the podcast, um, please go ahead and subscribe, share with your friends and family. At the end of the day, like I always say, I Don't take anything I say all that seriously. I mean, what the hell do I know? I still live in a condo. Maybe inside a single family home, you learn that killing bees to make short-term Botox is one of the secrets of the universe. I just don't know. Maybe that's what you learn when you don't live in a condo, when you graduate to a, a ranch, maybe. Maybe that's what you learn. I don't know. So don't take anything I'm saying here too seriously. Who knows? It could be. As always, uh, shout out to my family and friends. I want to make sure I end every show with that. Um, I always want to thank the people that helped me get here. So I'll see you guys next time. And until then, just keep asking questions. Don't be afraid to admit when you don't know something. And don't feel silly to spend uh, far too long researching bees uh, on your Friday evening. Don't uh, Don't be afraid to do something like that. Anyway, I'll see you guys later. Hope you enjoyed it.